mean, it just struck me because it was an excellent description of what we call an escalation to extremes where the rivalries, the us versus them thinking becomes so stark and intense that all we can see is how different we are from one another. And there seems to be no, like the reporter said, no middle ground. And when there's no uh, middle ground, when those differences are the only thing we can see, that's when we're most in danger of scapegoating one another. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Raven Cast. My name is Adam Erickson, and today we have a very special Halloween episode. Uh, we're going to talk about politics and apocalypse, and I'm here with my dear friend, Suzanne Ross. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Adam. Happy Halloween. Oh, happy Halloween. <laughs> happy Halloween. Are you dressing up tonight? Uh, no, but I'm trick-or-treating. Oh, you are? Good. Awesome. Yes. But and I did dress up for our Halloween party over the weekend. Oh, so very I'm, nice. Yeah, I was the one of the witches from Hocus Pocus. Oh, that sounds like fun. I don't think I've ever seen that movie. I, oh, I you, oh, you must. I know. I shouldn't have admitted that. Oh no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. It's a, it's All right, we little, can still be friends. Yes, yes, okay. we can. But it's an annual tradition here, and now yeah. I have the costume, so I can oh, be Winnie from Hocus Pocus. Uh, uh, that's good. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, speaking of uh, Hocus Pocus and Halloween, <laughs> and uh, you may have noticed that the political atmosphere in the United States is gone. I don't know what, what's the word. Apocalyptic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was. It, it's interesting. Of course, that's a word that we use um, here at Raven because, uh, for a couple of reasons, one, it's very biblical, and yeah. it, there's a warning in the New Testament about um, what what can happen to us if we don't reform our ways and repent. And um, but also because Rene Girard talks about um, apocalyptic. Uh, relationships and uh, and outcomes, and we we actually found an article this week where where a reporter was talking about the political atmosphere as being apocalyptic. Yes, and when reporters are using words like apocalypse, <laughs> I, my inner nerd is just gets all <laughs> excited. So uh, you wanted to come on and talk about it uh, today, and um, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, I, we, I just want to read one paragraph from this article that uh, you found on the Washington Post. Um, it is titled Bomb Scares and the Politics of Apocalypse. Uh, you know, last week, we, there were all those. Last week was brutal. It was brutal. Yeah. All those bomb scares and so many things happening. Uh, but the quote from the article is, is this. Uh, it says, this is a time of the politics of the apocalypse an all or nothing view of the difference between winning and losing an election and of holding power or not holding it. This, there is no middle ground on what winning or losing means. This has been on the rise for a long time, but it has intensified of late. No one really knows how to roll it back. Politicians say that it is time for the country to come together, but on whose terms? Right. And that's when you get the, you know, music in the background that goes. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> well, exactly. I, I mean, it just struck me because it was an excellent description of what we call an escalation to extremes where the rivalries, the us versus them thinking becomes so stark and intense that all we can see is how different we are from one another. And there seems to be no like the reporter said no middle ground. And when there's no uh, middle ground, when those differences are the only thing we can see, that's when we're most in danger of scapegoating one another. And when we find it hard to, as he said, step back from it, because we think we've got a hold of the truth and the other side is the absolute enemy of all that's good and true. Yeah. You know? It's a dangerous situation uh, that we find ourselves in. But part of the danger of the situation is 
a misunderstanding of the biblical term apocalypse. Yes. Uh, because, you know, I, um, I like, I just as much as anyone else, even though I know Gerard, throw my blame around here and there. <laughs> and I blame uh, the whole series titled, uh, what was, oh, uh, Left Behind. Yeah. For, for a radical misunderstanding of the biblical apocalypse. So uh, what, may, what many people think of as apocalypse is end of the world violence and destruction, which is not what apocalypse means in the original Greek language. Apocalypse means an unveiling or a revealing of the truth. And uh, Gerard in his book, Battling to the End, as you mentioned earlier, says that this is a, it, his whole uh, career was about unveiling the truth about human violence. Right. And Gerard didn't unveil the truth about human violence, Jesus did. I mean, so here's, here's the unveiling when Jesus says, those who live by the sword, die by the sword. That's what violence does. Like it just, it repeats itself over and over again. People mimic the violence against them. That's why Jesus says, uh, turn the other cheek. This isn't about like being weak. It's about <laughs> stopping the violence in its track. Because if you don't turn the other cheek and you hit back, then you're just in this exchange of violence back and forth. Mm -hmm. So apocalypse is, it literally means unveiling of this mechanism of violence. And that's what Jesus does. Uh, a lot of people want to look to the book of Revelation for as an apocalyptic book. And it is. In many chapters in Revelation, uh, you have, um, I think it's in chapter 18, you have this constant battle between uh, con empires from the north and empires from the south and one goes this way and the other goes this way mm -hmm. and it's just this constant back and forth of violence but what in revelation chapter 5 how do the christians respond to this violence Tell they me. don't part they don't participate in it right they don't you can go straight to revelation chapter 5 and it says um if you are going to be persecuted you're going to be persecuted you're not going to fight back that's the whole ethic in the book of Revelation. Don't get caught up in the violence. Right. And and the very powerful image of the um, of God appearing in the form of the lamb that's been sacrificed since the beginning. This is the vehicle for the ending of violence. It's, again, the terrible misunderstanding yeah. that the violence in the book of Revelation, as anywhere in the Bible, gets attributed to God when the text is trying to tell us this this isn't god god is the one who the violence is is being directed at who is suffering the violence and I'm, by I'm, suffering it reveals the truth about it yeah i'm glad you said that because many people will look to i think it's revelation 19 when jesus is on the horse and he's got the sword and he's got blood dripping down his gown and stuff his white gown and people will say see there it is like in the end jesus is going to come back and with a sword and he's going to kill everyone but uh he it's it's whose blood is it that's on him <laughs> <laughs> right. He's coming yeah. in uh, and it's his own blood that's on yeah. him. And the sword is has always been used as a metaphor for truth. Like yeah. the sword is the what cuts through the truth. And as Stephen McKenna likes to call it, the bullshit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's what that's yeah. what the sword of truth is all about. Yeah. So and yeah, Jesus takes that virus upon himself. Now, yeah. Jesus doesn't just. Uh, reveal the truth about our violence, he also gives us a way out. Right. So uh, you can see it in, in kind of a negative way of, um, of, of not responding to violence with violence. Mm -hmm. uh, turn the other cheek. Jesus says, uh, I give you a new commandment, which mm -hmm. is to love, to love one another. To love even those you call your enemies. So that's how extreme this goes. And the extreme that it goes to for Jesus is to go to the cross in order to right. show God's radical love for everyone that uh, responds with forgiveness. Right. To this one. Yeah. Now, this, this can get misunderstood as saying, hey, just let, just let evil uh, run its course, step back, just, you know, forgive it, let it happen. But that's not it either, because Jesus certainly says no to the corruption that is happening and to the violence that is happening in his world. And sometimes when you say no to those things, those forces uh, fight against you all the more, which is also what the apocalypse is about. 
Right. And, and I think it is, you know, it was a, an accurate a, a way to describe our political moment to say it is apocalyptic because also one of the, um, the things that Jesus calls us to do is not just to recognize violence in others, but to have a confessional stance towards our own violence. Um, we're, we're called to repentance. We're not called to accusation and judgment and ferreting out the bad guy. That, that's not the, what G Jesus and other faith traditions as well have this wisdom embedded in it. Um, it's, it's across uh, the revealed religions that the way to transform the world, what, uh, what the divine call is toward is repentance and mm -hmm. your own soul searching. And in the political moment we're in, it is totally a moment of accuse, accusing the other. Here's, of, yeah, here's where I see it most clearly in the group that I most identify with uh, Democrats. Okay, there's this democratic slogan uh, going around now that says, when they go low, you kick them. Right. And that is, uh, that is apocalyptic. That is like, mm -hmm. that is the, like the, the apocalyptic warning is when you, when you have the mindset, when they go low, you kick them. The apocalyptic warning is a revelation that says, if they go low, you kick them, you are going to destroy yourselves mm -hmm. by kicking one another. Yes. Like the violence is going to get out of control. So you have to stop kicking one another. <laughs> right. And, you know, we're having this wonderful debate, which I think is important about rhetoric and speech and, and when is speech harmful? When is it um, inciting to violence and when is it necessary to call out the truth? And I think one of the um, guides to um, to understanding speech comes comes out of the whole bit tradition of how do you interpret the biblical text? Because there's lots of violence in the Bible and lots of incitement to violence in the Bible. And so those of us who call ourselves Christians have to deal with that and say, well, how am I interpreting that? How do I read that? Do I say, yeah, there are bad guys and and the, the disciples think that's what their job is. I don't remember the um, gospel passage, passage exactly, but it's they're going through town to town and they come to this town that won't accept what they're saying. And they come back to Jesus and say, hey, you gave us all this power. Should we call down the wrath of God on the town? And Jesus is like, no, are you guys ever going to get it? And that's the thing. Like they, <laughs> they would have biblical precedent to call the wrath of God down on these towns, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Mm -hmm. God does it. So, why can't we? Right. Well, <laughs> Jesus comes in and says, hey, we're not doing that. Right. That's, that's not how we roll. Right. So we roll the, a different way. We roll a different way. And the er, very early um, church father, um, Augustine, addressed this directly. Right. And I, I think you should say this. I'm, I only hear it from my wonderful friends who are preachers like yourself, who teach me about <laughs> Augustine. But w could you talk about that hermeneutic that he offered? Well, it was Augustine and it was Athanasius and it was all of these church fathers and um, they, uh, the principle for dealing with these passages uh, is to go by Jesus's teaching, which is, uh, he's asked, um, what, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor. And so they end up saying, wow, we're called to follow Jesus in every aspect of our lives, including uh, in how we read the Bible. And so they would say, if this passage does not lead us to love God and our neighbor uh, in a better way, then we need to find a different way to interpret it. And right. so many early uh, Christians, church fathers, in highly influential ones, Augustine, um, end up saying, well, you, you, you can't take this literally. Uh, so they would say the conquest of uh, Canaan looks nothing like the person Jesus who reveals God to us in, on a concrete level. So mm -hmm. how do you interpret that? They interpret it as figuratively as, um, or allegorically as uh, a battle raging within yourself. And who's gonna, who's gonna win that battle? 
uh, Joshua, uh, the leader of the Israelites, is inside of you and um, leading the charge against the Canaanites who are inside of you. <laughs> and uh, so Joshua is going to win. What are you going to do to help Joshua win? So they would interpret it in similar ways to that. Right. And of course, Islam picks up on that interpretive uh, tool as well to say that the battle between good and evil is within us, each mm -hmm. one of us, and we must strive uh, for the good, with, it, but to take responsibility for our own behavior. And I think this is sort of, you know, coming back to that question raised in the news mm -hmm. article was, you know, how are we going to step back from this? Is how what's the way out? And to say love it, uh, often sounds like, as you said, like a cop out, like, well, wishy -washy. then, yeah, wishy-washy, then you're letting the, the forces of evil live. You can't just we love a bad guy, whatever. Um, but that's getting again into this divide of emphasizing differences rather than seeing our common humanity. And I just wanted to bring into the conversation, maybe it's a, a good way to sort of tie things up here, um, because I recently watched um, the movie that came out earlier this year, uh, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's won a lot of awards. It's also gotten a lot of critique because it's so violent and so filled. It's a movie filled with hate and violence. And um, but what one thing I learned from my friend Gareth Higgins, who's a uh, movie critic, uh, he taught me that there there are movies with violence in them, and there are movies about violence. Meaning, to, in other words, to diagnose and understand how violence works, you're going to have some violence in the movie, mm -hmm. and that's what's in the Bible as well. The Bible is a book about violence. It's not just gratuitously there; it's there for reasons to reveal to us to uh, how we get caught up in it. But in this movie, I know you didn't see it yet, Adam, did you? No. no. Uh, so I'm I'm not gonna give all the plot. It's a complicated story and very moving, but um, it ends with um, uh, the, the, uh, the sheriff in the town who has been the subject of just hate and vitriol coming from the mother of a girl who, who was murdered in the town. And she's just pissed at this sheriff, Willoughby, that he hasn't solved the crime yet. Mm -hmm. Hence the three billboards go up calling him to account and whatever. And she just is angry to the point of violence. And she's violent in the movie. And Sheriff Willoughby has a young um, uh, cop working with him who's also angry and violent, but he's violent in defense of the sheriff. And, and he wants to protect the sheriff. His name is Jason. The, the, the officer's name is Jason. And um, anyway, the sheriff is, um, I won't tell you how he's, you know, why he commits suicide, but he does commit suicide at the end of the movie. And he writes a letter to to Jason. He writes a letter to a bunch of the characters, but this part where he writes the letter to Jason to me demonstrates what it means to say that love can transform someone, can, can turn them away from this virulent hate and anger that leads to violence and that, um, and, and how it works. And I just love that it's in the, uh, the, the voice for, uh, this wisdom comes from the sheriff who's been trying to keep the peace in the town. He's never pulls his gun out of his holster, but he's trying to keep the peace. And this is, if, if you can indulge me, I'll read, um, read the letter, uh, not as well as um, Woody Harrelson does it, who, who's the sheriff, um, Sheriff Willoughby. But it, here, here's the, the quote, Jason Willoughby here. I'm dead now, sorry about that. But there's something I wanted to say to you that I never really said when I was alive. I think you've got the makings of being a really good cop, Jason. And you know why? Because deep down you're a decent man. I know you don't think I think that, but I do, dipshit. You play hopscotch when you think no one's looking for Christ's sakes. I do think you're too angry though. 
And I know it's all since your dad died and you had to go look after your mom and all, but as long as you hold on to so much hate, then I don't think you're ever going to become what I know you want to become, a detective. Because you know what you need to become a detective, and I know you're going to wince when I say this, but what you need to become a detective is love. Because through love comes calm, and through calm comes thought. And you need thought to detect stuff sometimes, Jason. It's kind of all you need. You don't even need a gun. And you definitely don't need hate. Hate never solved anything, but calm did. And thought did. Try it. Try it just for a change. And I absolutely love it because... To me, that the the symbolism of being a detective is is for me the search for what's true, what's really happening, and how do we find the truth and move through some sort of um, you know solution to our problems together? Because uh, I just found this to be so moving and and such a beautiful expression of what we mean when we say. Hate is just going to escalate into violence, and love is the way through it. And and what love looks like here is helping someone see the truth about themselves that they don't even know about themselves. Yeah, and seeing seeing the truth about our own selves, <laughs> right? How, as you said earlier, that we're we're caught up in. Uh, the violent mechanisms as well and how to, yeah. how to tease that out. And yeah. um, it's a powerful story. So thank you it for that. Really and thank is. you for the conversation, Suzanne. I hope you have a great rest of your Halloween. Oh, it's all about the candy now. It's, it's one thirty <laughs> your time. When does the Halloween start? In about two hours. About two hours. I'm going so trick or treating with the grandkids. So wonderful. It's Sounds so much fun. fantastic. Awesome. Yep. And thank you everybody for uh, watching and uh, stay tuned for our next Ravencast episode. Until yeah. then. And do yeah. we want to put a link into um, our interview with Christian Picciolini as well? Oh, uh, yeah. We At will the do end that. of this, yeah. Yeah, because there's been a lot of uh, horrific white supremacy happening, and Christian has a lot of wonderful things to say about um, how to move beyond hate. Uh, especially for white supremacists. So he knows from personal experience. We're yes. going to we're going to link to that. So um thank you for bringing that up and uh till next time. Take care. Bye-bye.